Well, good morning and welcome to our morning service. Uh, this is not how I was expecting to be preaching this morning. In fact, I can honestly say I've never actually taken a service remotely like this uh, within the confines of my own home. However, it was uh, the decision was taken uh, yesterday, Saturday, to uh, close the church just due to the health and safety of all the members and adherents and all those in attendance because the, the church uh, was no, there was attempts made to uh, to defrost the grounds but unfortunately the ice was that thick these tents proved to be unfruitful so unfortunately we're just going to have to uh, we took the difficult decision as a Kirk session uh, made a very difficult decision that the church would be closed so the the prayer meeting last night uh, did not go ahead. And unfortunately, it also means that the planned event for the Sunday school today will also have to be cancelled. However, we do uh, thank and praise God that he has given us this ability to uh, continue and get some form of a service. So we can study his word. We can still come before him in prayer in spite of these cancellations. Now, so we do pray that this will be a, a blessed time for each and every one of us. And we pray also that you are stay, managing to stay warm and also stay safe in these uh, conditions that some parts of the world, they get them considerably worse. But the problem is we're just not used to them in this part of the world. So when they do come, unfortunately, they really can uh, prove, provide to be a bit of a problem. Now, we'll start with, this is just going to be, sorry, a service, uh, a Bible reading, a prayer, a children's address and a sermon. I'm not going to sing. Uh, probably you'll probably be most you would be quite glad to hear that so we're going to start with we're going to have uh, three different readings they're all fairly short uh, because the Christmas event for the Sunday school was planned for straight after the service I had actually intended this to be a, a somewhat shorter sermon than I would do normally so unfortunately given uh, that uh, I only got uh, told that this was being cancelled yesterday I didn't really have time to go back and uh, redo the sermon. So this may be a slightly shorter sermon than we're maybe used to, but we still pray that God will use his word and that God will uh, use the, the preaching of his word to bless all those who listen. Right, so the first reading we're going to take is from John chapter 1. Now this is going to be in two sections, John chapter 1. So we're going to read what, verses 1 to 18 and that's going to be followed by 29 to 34. Then we're going to read a very short section uh, from Matthew. So we've got uh, Matthew chapter 11 verses 25 and 30. So we're going to first of all read from John. So John 1 reading from verse 1. Let us all hear the word of God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him there was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. 
For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. Now, and if we come down a few verses to verse 29, we're going to commence a reading from there, just a few verses, 29 to 34. The next day he saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Now, turning back in our Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, and we are going to read from chapter 11, and just a few short verses, verses 25 to 30. So Matthew 11, verses 25 to 30. At, this ta at that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. And may the Lord add his blessing to that reading of his holy word. Let us now come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Lord and loving Heavenly Father, King of kings and Lord of lords, we are not gathered in your house today due to the weather, Lord. But we thank you, Lord, that you have given us this means, Lord, where your word can still go out, where we can still meet as your people, although not, uh, not in the physical sense. But yet, O oh Lord, it is truly a blessing that we should be so thankful for. O oh Lord, help us to truly count our blessings, especially at this time of the year. We thank you, Lord, for the roof over our head, for the clothes that we wear. We thank you for the food you provide for us. O oh Lord, so often we are so guilty of taking these things for granted. But we pray, O oh Lord, that you will... Uh, give us a truly thankful heart. We may offer thanks from the very innermost steps, Lord, not just give you lip service. Oh, gracious Lord, we think especially at this time of year, and we thank you, O oh Lord, for the greatest gift of all, the gift of your Son, who came into this world, who left the realms of glory, the state of absolute perfection, and he tabernacled amongst us in a sinful world, not to live the life of a king, but rather he came and lived the life of a pauper. He was rejected by his own people. And he bled and died on that cross. And he drank the full cup of your wrath. And he did all this for us. For, Lord, there was no other way that the payment for sin could be made. Oh, gracious Lord, we thank you for that, Lord, and help us to truly remember the true meaning of Christmas at a time when the world has largely hijacked and made it a holiday about indulgence and consumerism and has done its best to push you away. But, O oh Lord, we pray that you will give us a word in season, 
and that you will give us this opportunity to reach out to others, to speak over what it means. Even in the name of Christmas, you are glorified. The word Christ is still there. And help us, O Lord, to have you at the very centre of our hearts, the very centre of our minds and thoughts as the season approaches. O gracious Lord, we pray for all our members and adherents, Lord. All those who would be normally joined with us in the church building on this day. O Lord, we pray for them. You know them. You know each and every one of them intricately. You know their cares and their worries. Lord, we pray especially for those who find this time of year difficult, for whom there is an empty seat at the table, for whom the house that was once bustling now has little but silence. O gracious Lord, we pray that you will be their comforter, that they may feel your presence close by them, And that you will use us, Lord, to go out and be the light and to spread your word in a dark world. And in this opportunity, Lord, that you have given us, may we not shy away. May we not hide ourselves in our own homes and seek to self-gratify as the the world largely does. But rather, O Lord, may we take this opportunity that you have given us, and may you use us as your chosen servants. O gracious Lord, we thank you, not just for the gift of Jesus, the greatest gift of all, but we also thank you for your word, how it is a living and breathing and true, Lord, as relevant today as to the day it was penned, and although penned by human hands, Each and everything was inspired by you, by God above from on high. And how much, O Lord, we thank you for it. We thank you, O Lord, that it is available in a language that we can understand. And we pray for all those who do not yet have a full copy of your word in their own native language. We thank you, O Lord, for those who go, who spend their lives devoted to translating the Bible into the native languages, Lord, of others. Lord, we pray that there will come a day when there will be not a single person on this world who does not have access to your word and who is not able to understand it. But, O oh Lord, we know that head knowledge is not enough. O oh Lord, it is only enough when you open our eyes, when you open our hearts to receive it. O oh Lord, we, we thank you, those of us who are your children. We thank you, Lord, that you have called us. And that you have given us that understanding. And that you have led us to watch this stream this morning. We know ourselves, Lord, we can think back to a time when this would have been the last thing we wanted to hear. We would have done our best to avoid it. But yet, O Lord, we also know that the call of the gospel is an irresistible one. And that nothing within us can stop us coming when you call us to you. O gracious Lord, we pray for these few moments that we can spend our time focused upon you. May we take our cares and our worries and place them upon you. And may you guard our minds and our hearts, for we know this is the very time when the evil one seems to attack us with such a fierceness. But, O Lord, may we put on your full armour, that armour that we read about in your word, Lord, in Ephesians 6. May we put on each piece, Lord, with care. May we not leave a single gap. May not one of the enemy's fiery darts penetrate even the slightest bit. Gracious Lord, we pray for the children, Lord, who would normally be here, Lord, on this day. Lord, we pray that you will bless them, that you will open their minds, and also that you will guard their hearts, Lord. May their confidence be rooted in you, Lord, and in your word. For they are being taught so many things that are so contrary to the word. O Lord, we pray that you will 
be with them, Lord, and that you will send your children into their lives, that they, they may hear your word, Lord. And rather than a moral compass which seems to be swinging wildly each day, yet, O oh Lord, your word remains steadfast. It is unchangeable, for indeed you are unchangeable. But if you were to change, you would no longer be God. You are perfect in every way. And how much we thank you for that, that we have that rock and that stability in our lives. And we pray, Lord, that you, Lord, will help us as we go out into the world. May we not be caught up in worldly discussion, but rather may we keep our mind and heart focused upon you. Hear us in our prayers and forgive our many sins. For all we ask in Jesus' precious name, for his sake and glory. Now, before turning to the service itself, I would like to actually just have a brief chat to the children. I hope there are some listening, but I know you would be in the church. Now, this time of year, as you heard me in the prayer, uh, this type of year has been caught up. I mean, we can see Christmas adverts on telly from pretty much the beginning of November. And sadly, how little we see of Christ in them, if anything at all. Instead, what do we see? We see, oh, buy this and you'll be happy. But they're selling a lie because they all seem to show that they'll be happy. People are happy when they gain material possessions, when they get stuff, whether it's maybe clothes or maybe more aimed at toys for some people your age, or maybe it's the latest gadget, a new computer or a computer game. They're selling you this lie that this will make you happy. How do we actually know it's a lie? Well, because every year we get given more and more, each and every one of us, whether we're a child or whether we're a grown adult or, or even an old age pensioner. We get more and more. And if we're relying on that for happiness, we'll never be happy. We'll never be content. Because it is only in Christ we can find happiness, contentment and satisfaction. It's not that these gifts are sinful. Of course I'm not saying that. When you get your presents next week, God willing, I want you to be happy. We all do. But we also want you to be thanking the one from whom they came. Not the person who's tagged there on, although it is important to put that. Not the person whose name it is, but rather, may we be thanking God for all he gives us. Look around the world and we'll see plenty who are in need. We don't actually even need to go far. We see the food banks are always calling out for people. There's plenty of people, maybe even people you sit beside in class and school, who are maybe going hungry. We just don't know the situation. But we do... Uh, we do give thanks, and we want you to give thanks for each and everything. The world will get stuff, and it doesn't, it doesn't make them happy. How do we know this? Because what comes on the telly the, as soon as Christmas Day comes? People realise they've been sold a lie. Because Christmas Day comes, they get their stuff, they've got a big maybe family round about them, they're having a dinner, and it doesn't bring them satisfaction. These times are indeed blessed times, if we keep them in perspective. But what happens then when we maybe sit and watch a Christmas movie on the telly and an advert comes on, Boxing Day sales, oh you weren't happy with this, but we'll, you can maybe buy more. But instead this Christmas, instead of looking at, what else can I get? I didn't get what I wanted, or it wasn't the this exact thing that I wanted. Instead. May we be thankful to God for all the gifts he gives us. And let us remember of the greatest gift that he has given us, the Lord Jesus Christ, who came into this world. And he came there. He came for you. He came for me. Without him, there is no hope of salvation. Without him, we would all be lost. Without him, we would be in the cycle that the world's in, always looking to find something and realising that when we get it, 
it's not satisfying. So let us keep Christ in Christmas. Amen. Now, turning to the text we read, the focus verse that I actually wish to look at is Matthew 11, and we're going to look at verse 28. Words of Jesus. Come to me, all, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now, I want to offer this verse as a Christmas invitation. The end of another year is close at hand. Another Christmas is drawing near. Families are making plans to visit and meet up over the holiday season. Friends are inviting friends to get together and enjoy some time. It can be a time of informal fellowship. But surely at this very time, the invitation of the gospel cannot be out of season. You may have heard this invitation before, and I've had it repeated many a time from the pulpit of the church within the very walls of the church. However, it is one of unspeakable importance and concerns the eternal happiness state and ultimately the destination of your soul. My goal here is certainly not to spoil your Christmas or your festivities. Rather, it is to make us think. Let us consider that there are some who will be missing Christmas parties this month, who a year ago appeared to be alive and well. There are some who will be eating around a family Christmas dinner table, who in a year's time will be lying in the grave, having been called into eternity. The point is that we do not know how long we will be granted on the earth. Tomorrow is promised to none of us, but the invitation and offer of salvation is here today. The message from Jesus here today for each and every one of us is come to me, all you who labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now there are four points that I'd like to consider from this verse of scripture. So firstly, who is the speaker of this invitation? Secondly, to whom is this invitation for? Thirdly, what does the speaker ask us to do? And fourthly, what does the speaker offer to give? Well, firstly, who is the speaker of this invitation? This world, as we said to the children, will promise us many things, especially at this time of year. Supermarkets have adverts telling us that they're, what they have can promise them that they can offer a perfect family Christmas that will bring joy to all in attendance. When we receive an invitation to an event, one of the questions that we will ask is who sent this invitation? This is right and proper. We should accept every invitation and offer that is sent to us. Then we may fall into traps if we do this. We could end up being conned. We could end up losing money. We may end up, by keeping poor company, making choices that hurt ourselves and also those we love. So who is the sender of this invitation? It is none other than the eternal Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who is almighty. He is God, the Father's equal. By him were all things made, and in him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. He has all the power in heaven and earth. He holds the keys to death and hell. Friends, when one such as this speaks, then we can safely trust him. What he promises, not only is he able to fulfill, but he must fulfill. God cannot lie or break his promises. But if he were to do that, that would result in him being imperfect. And if he is imperfect, therefore he would cease to be God. We can watch programs on TV and there's one that 
I always shudder when I hear the name. It's Holidays from Hell. People who have experienced poor quality holidays go on and all oh, they talk about the emotional trauma that they went through and how this week or two week ordeal ruined their lives and they have to live with the agony of all this. Typical human response over the top. And it's also another example of how this world promises so much but yet so often fails to deliver. But surely all of these pale into complete insignificance when we think about, as we ought to as is right, what Jesus did for us at this time of year. Let us keep our focus upon him. He's the one who loved us so much that he left the glory and perfection of heaven for a season. And he came down to earth living approximately 33 years, having left glory. 33 years he spent in this fallen and sinful world. He loved us so much that he was willing to be despised and rejected by people. He lived the life of a pauper. He didn't come here and live in the life of a a prince in a palace, even that would have been a huge downturn for him compared to heaven. But you may think, oh, well, he at least had the best of a bad situation. No, he didn't. He lived the life of a pauper. He died, not just a death, but an accursed death on the cross. Not only enduring the physical agony of crucifixion, which none of us can relate to in the slightest. But yet, what was worse for him, which we can never get our head round, not this side of glory anyway. He paid the debt that we owed for our sins on that cross on Calvary, where he took the full wrath of God, where it caused him an agony to say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Surely, for one who did all this for us, then when he speaks, he deserves our ear and our attention. When God promises something, then we need not worry about whether he will keep his promises. For his own name's sake, he must keep his word. So you have now heard who sends this invitation. And may we grant him our undivided attention. Let us not refuse him an audience. May we consider the words of Hebrews 12, 25. See that you do not refuse him who speaks. For if they did not escape who refused him who spoke on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him who speaks from heaven. So secondly, to whom is this invitation for? Jesus invites all that labour and are heavy laden. It's wide, it's a, a sweeping and comprehensive call that describes the case of millions and dare I say billions across the globe. It describes people of every class, every climate and every country. No matter where we try and retreat to on this earth, we are going to find trouble, anxiety, murmuring, discontent and unrest. God did not create humanity to be unhappy. He placed them in an absolute perfection in Eden. And even after the fall, right up to this very moment, God blesses his people and showers us with gifts as well as raining common grace on every human on the face of this earth. What is the cause of this trouble in our lives, of every, the lives of every human in this world? Sin. 
sin results in departure from God. And this is the reason that people are laboring and heavy laden. Sin is such a universal disease. It doesn't just affect humanity. It affects the whole earth. Are you laboring and heavy laden today? If you want rest from a guilty heart and a sore conscience, then there is hope for you. Then you are the very person that Jesus invites. Now you may well answer me and say, this invitation cannot be for me. No, I can't. it can't be for me. And you say, you're not good enough to be invited by Christ. Let us reread the invitation. Jesus does not invite the good. He calls all that are labour and are heavy laden. We'll never be good enough to earn God's salvation. If we could be, then Christ didn't need to come into this world and his death was a wasted effort. But nothing God does is wasted. If you believe you are not good enough, then you are in the perfect place to come to him. Jesus himself stated in Matthew chapter 9, verse 12, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. You may answer me back and say that it can't possibly be for you, as you are the chief of sinners. My friends, it doesn't matter what you are or what you have been. Jesus calls you to him. He took the punishment that your sins deserve. His blood covers all sins. Not most sins, not the majority, but all sins. Do you honestly believe that your sins are greater than God's power? Again, another person might say, that this call can't be for the can't be for them because they're unconverted. This call does not go out to those who are converted. It goes out to all who labor and are heavy laden. Is there a burden in your heart and your life? Then you are the one of those to whom this call goes out and Christ invites. Well, okay, you may continue to argue that this can't be for you because you do not know if you are one of God's elect. And let me respond by saying, what right do you have to put words into God's mouth which he has not used? Jesus did not say, come unto me, you who are the elect. Let us not get tied up in knots on the doctrine of election. Rather, let's take Jesus at his word. May we not ignore the words of Jesus as is recorded in John 6, verse 37. The one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. Let us come to him with a sincere heart, a repentant heart. And he promises he will not reject us. Or do we declare Jesus to be a liar? My friends, do not turn away from this invitation. Do not let pride, self-righteousness, or self-loathing, or fear of others make you reject this loving offer from our Lord. So thirdly, what does the speaker ask us to do? Three words sum up this offer. Come to me. These simple words carry a deep mine of truth. Notice Jesus didn't say, come to me and work. What rest would that give to those who were tired? He doesn't say, come and pay what you owe. We can never repay him. Nothing of our own endeavours can add anything not a single thing to our salvation. What comfort that ought to bring us. It's all in his work. He doesn't say, come to me, stand still and wait. That would be like a mockery. 
that would be like a doctor beside a patient who was in their dying hours, or being told maybe they had 24 hours to live, saying that he would come back and provide treatment next week. No. Jesus says, come now, today, at once, come without delay. Coming to Christ is coming to him with a heart of simple faith. Believing on Christ is coming to him, and coming to Christ is believing on him. It is the act of the soul which takes place when a person knowing their own sins and despairing of all other hope commits themselves to Christ for salvation, trusts in him, and casts themselves wholly upon him. This invitation of Christ is now before you. If you have never listened to it before, then I beg of you, listen to it today. It's a broad, wide, full, free, simple, tender and kind. That invitation will leave you without any excuse at the last if you hear this and refuse to accept it. There are some Christmas invitations that are wiser to decline than accept. But this is one if you have not accepted it before. You must accept it today, for today is the day of salvation. Fourthly, what does the speaker offer to give? One word, rest. Those who work all know the pleasant feeling as the holidays, or a weekend even, approaches. Whether we put down the tools of a trade or shut off the computer for the final time in a week, we can all appreciate a time of rest. It is indeed a pleasant thing. But what is the rest? What is this rest that Christ offers? It is not merely bodily rest. A person can have that and yet still be truly miserable. The rest that Christ gives is an inward thing. It is a rest of mind, affection, will. It is the rest that only a child of God can relate to. Safe in the knowledge that their sins are forgiven and guilt is put away. It offers a hope for things to come that nothing in this world can affect. It is a hope that is out of reach of human violence, disease, and it's even death itself. It is a rest that gives us peace in the fact that when life's journey is done, heaven will be our home, where we will be in God's presence, and sin and death will be defeated forever. There is no true inward happiness until the true King is seated on his rightful throne of a person's heart. Rest such as this is the privilege of all believers in Christ. However, some know more of it and some know less. Some may only feel it at intervals of life, while others experience it almost all of their lives. Few enjoy it, though, without many a battle with unbelief and many a conflict with fear. Whilst you are living a worldly life, maybe even coming to church out of routine, Satan will largely leave you alone. But the moment we open our ears and we listen, the barriers come down, the defences are put away, and we start taking interest in the things of God and the Bible, then he'll start his attack. He'll pour lies upon lies onto us to try and get us to turn away from God. But we must take everything to the Bible. Let us be found in it daily. Satan will say one thing, but God will counter it through his word. You're too bad, you're too sinful, he'll say. God answers to you in the Bible, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 The devil will say, you're insignificant, you're a nobody. Maybe the important people can be saved, but God doesn't want you. Jesus says, come to me. 
all who truly come to Christ know something of the rest he gives. Ask them with all their trials and doubts if they would give up Christ and go back to the world and they will give you one answer. Weak as their sense of rest may be, they have got a hold of something that does them good. And this something is a something that they simply cannot let go of. This Christmas, the invitation of Jesus is before you. Come to me, all you who labour and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Amen. And now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit rest abound and abide with you all, this day and forevermore. Amen.